Trudeau, who's recently come to the Washington area from Canada, and uh, we was over during all that. Yep, yep. Uh, he is trained in astronomy and in engineering physics. He has a doctorate in engineering physics. Uh, he's worked in astronomy, he's worked in laser communications, uh, and he's an avid amateur astronomer still, and a blogger. What's the name of the... Uh, uh, Cosmic Pursuits. Cosmic Dot com, yeah. So you can see his work in his comments and his observations there. Um, he's going to speak to us tonight on backyard cosmology, which seems to be a very interesting topic because, from my point of view, I like to understand the things that I'm looking at and have some reason to look at them, not just say, here's what I'm going to do. Thank you, uh, thank you, Ellen. It's uh, good to be here. It's the first uh, after dinner talk I've given uh, for a long time, at least uh, in front of sober people. So this is uh, <laughs> this is a <laughs> it's a little a little nerve wracking. Um, so yeah. Are they? Okay, okay, let's hope I survive the next hour. Maybe I'll make one. Um, so yeah, I am talking tonight about backyard cosmology, which is, it seems like an oxymoron, but bear with me here. Um, I mean, most of us might agree that uh, we live in a golden age of, of astronomy, where the most important facts of the universe have uh, become clear to us. So we understand, for example, that in the universe there's 100 billion trillion stars, that we live in a galaxy, the Milky Way, that's one of hundreds of billions of galaxies strewn across the universe. And uh, the fact we know that the universe is expanding and most amazingly it actually had a beginning about 13.8 billion years ago. So these things have become clear to us just in the last 100 or 200 years, which is just a tiny fraction of, our, of, our, uh, of the time frame of our civilization, uh, which in turn is a, a tiny fraction of the time fr frame our species has been around. But all these facts have been discovered by astronomers looking at the same sky we're going to look at tonight, if the weather holds. Now, in other sciences, just regular people like us can't look at the interesting bits and pieces, right? I mean, not without expensive equipment and a lot of training. We can't see atoms, we can't see molecules, we can't see DNA, we can't see the conduction band of a semiconductor, we can't see quarks. But astronomers are lucky, because we can look into the same sky that was looked into by Galileo, by uh, by Newton, by uh, William Herschel, Edwin Hubble. And we can see many of the same things that they saw, even with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. So that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. A short list, a subset of a longer list that I've been playing with in my mind for quite a while. And um, this list is going to help us tour the history of cosmology to help us better, better understand the universe. So at the risk of losing half the crowd here, I have to say we're not talking about looking into the sky as cutting-edge cosmologists, okay? So if you came here to measure the circular polarization of the cosmic background radiation with your 8-inch Schmidt casts, you're going to be disappointed tonight. We just, we can't analyze these things with our, we don't have the tools or the training. But one thing I noticed when I moved here, and this is an analogy, I noticed there is an enormous amount of civil war battlefields around here. I've no, we don't have anything like that in Canada. It's just, it's just amazing. So people love, people love to tour these things because they can see where great battles have been fought, where great generals and lowly foot soldiers have, have done fantastic things uh, in the past. So that's sort of what we're doing here, except we're looking at the places of intellectual battles in the night sky. Now, why should we bother organizing a list like this? Well, not to be down in Messier or Caldwell, but un unlike those lists, this is a list with a purpose. As I said, and as Alan said, this is going to help us tour the history of what we know about the universe. So it's a good way uh, for amateur astronomers to dip our feet into cosmology a bit. Most of us don't think about that. We know what the bits and pieces are in the sky, but we may not think about them from a cosmological perspective. It's also a good way to get newcomers into astronomy um, a lot of people get a little frustrated just looking at one darn thing after another in a telescope. 
But when you tell them what these things are and what they mean from in a coherent point of view, it holds their interest more. And even as experienced stargazers, this helps us uh, stretch our minds. And maybe we might pick up a book on cosmology or get a, a simple course on it. It also can stretch our equipment because some of the things I'm going to talk about tonight uh, are quite far away. So many of these objects you may have seen already. Some are obscure. One of them I'm standing on right now. Um, some are harder to see and require big optics. But all will take you on an intellectual and historical tour of cosmology. So being a good scientist, we need to have a working definition of what we mean by cosmology. So I picked one, the top one here, out of the uh, Encyclopedia of Astronomy and Astrophysics, a big out-of-print brick that I used in graduate school. And this is my favorite definition of cosmology. It's the attempt to construct a comprehensive model of the principal features of the material composition, the geometric structure, and the temporal evolution of the entire physically observable universe. Or, if you want to put it in a more family-friendly way, it's uh, the study of the composition, shape, the origin, and ultimate fate of the universe. All right, so let's get started on our list. So, the thing I'm standing on, of course, is the Earth. It's the only part of the cosmos that most of us will ever feel or touch or smell. It's our home, but what is it? So ancient civilizations scratched their heads over this, and it wasn't at all obvious to them what the Earth was. Of course, the Babylonians, the, the Sumerians, the Mesopotamians, they thought the Earth was flat, surrounded by a big, uh, a vast, unknowable cosmic ocean. And of course, when you look out at the Earth, especially from a mountaintop like we are right now, it makes sense to think that the Earth is flat, and the sky is impossibly far away. But about 2,500 years ago, the Greeks, who had a bit of time on their hands, started to think a little more carefully. And they began to notice a few things that suggested the Earth was a, a, a sphere, a big rocky, watery sphere. So one thing they noticed, for example, um, the Aristotle, for example, reasoned that a lunar eclipse is caused by the Earth passing between the moon and the sun and casting a shadow onto the surface of the moon. Now, he noticed that whenever a lunar eclipse happened, whatever time of night it happened, the shadow of the, shadow of the Earth cast on the moon is always circular, or a, uh, an arc of a circle, which strongly suggests that what's casting that shadow is a sphere, namely the Earth. Um, there's other evidence, too. Anyone who's ever gone to the Southern Hemisphere, or even down to Florida, if you notice you go south, new stars appear over the Southern Horizon. That is strong evidence the Earth is a sphere. If, we were, if it were flat, we'd all see the same, the same stars. Now, one clever Greek even uh, measured, assuming the Earth was a sphere, he measured the circumference of the Earth. So this was uh, uh, Eratosth Eratosthenes, about 200 BC. He was in a town, uh, Syene, in Egypt, and he noticed on a particular day of the year, if he put a stick in the ground at midday, it cast no shadow, meaning the sun was overhead. So he planned the experiment. He sent an assistant away to Alexandria, Egypt, and he, uh, his assistant put the same, did the same experiment at midday and noticed the shadow cast an angle of about seven degrees. Knowing the distance, measuring very carefully the distance between Syene and Alexandria, they were able to do a, some very simple trigonometry and measure the circumfer circumference of the Earth. And some uh, historical accounts of that suggest he, he measured it quite accurately. Uh, that is a circumference of about 40,000 kilometers. So this was a big step. Now, of course, once you get the Earth figure out, you have the rest of the universe. And it was pretty obvious to the ancients that the Earth was still and everything went around it. It stands to reason. Everything is moving and we're not. After all, if the Earth was moving, we would go flying off. There'd be huge winds. We would feel the motion. Now, it wasn't until uh, the Renaissance that, that Galileo and Newton explained why that's wrong. But there's a more compelling argument for a fixed Earth, even, even to the ancients. If the Earth was going back and forth around the sun, they reasoned, when the Earth was on one side of the sun, the stars would look different than if it was on the other side of the sun, just as if you know, you're moving your hand back and forth. It's an effect called parallax. No parallax was observed, so the Earth must be uh, the Earth must be still, or the stars are very, very far away. The Greeks chose the former. They chose the idea of a fixed Earth. And that idea was formalized by Aristotle for 2,000 years. What he said went in many, many fields, and it was actually adopted by the Catholic Church, Aristotle's model, for well into the sixth, 17th century. 
Okay. So to explain the motion of the planets in the sky with an Earth-centered universe is no mean feat. But since they were so persuaded the Earth was fixed and everything moved around it, there were more and more advanced models about how the solar system might work. And it culminated with a model by Claudius Ptolemy in the first century AD, who had, um, I don't know if I have a picture of it here. So, all right, well this is a, the top one is a, is a fancy picture of Ptolemy's model. But his idea is the Earth was at the center, then, then Venus, then, uh, then Mercury, then Venus, then the Sun, then the outer planets and so forth. And the outer planets went on epicycles to explain retrograde motion when it appears the planets stall in the sky from night to night, go backwards and then come back again. It was a huge kludged model, but it was reasonably accurate to explain the motion of the planets and it lasted for about 1500 years. Until Nicholas Copernicus, uh, a Polish uh, polymath, he was a, he was a doctor, a philosopher, a politician to, to some extent, for some reason that no one can quite put their finger on, he thought he conceived of a sun-centered universe. Now that idea was floating around ancient Greece and he might have written about that. But he put some meat on the bones of a sun-centered universe. He made his measurements of the planets and he believed that a sun-centered universe explained some things better. It explained some things worse. So it wasn't, it didn't get rid of, uh, of Ptolemy's um, model but it was a new idea that, that was put out there to consider. Now one thing Ptolemy and, and uh, Copernicus did not know is something Galileo discovered in the early 1600s when he looked at v Venus through his telescope and that, that is that Venus has phases, a full range of phases like the moon. And there is no way to explain that with Ptolemy's model uh, or, or any, any Earth-centric model. So when you look at Venus or Mercury, which has also a full range of, of phases, you're looking at indirect proof that the Earth goes around the Sun and Venus and Mercury are two inner planets. All right, so now let's move to another, the next stop on our, on our cosmic tour here and that's the planet Mars. So by 1600, the greatest astronomer in the world and certainly the most flamboyant was a Danish astronomer called Tycho Brahe. So I had, when I was a master's student in astronomy, we had a drinking club named after the Tycho Brahe, the Tycho Brahe Society. Um, anyway, uh, if you don't know about Tycho, I'd love to tell you about him. I know many stories. But um, Tycho made the most, most precise measurements of the planets to, to date. And one planet in particular bedeviled him, the planet Mars. He could not figure out why Mars moved at, as it did. His measurements were so precise that the model of Ptolemy and Copernicus showed uh, results that were way off, like way outside of experimental error, and it really bothered him. Tycho was a proponent of an of a Earth-centered universe, but he was an observer, so he was somewhat agno agnostic. Anyway, he gave the job of figuring out the motion of Mars to explain his measurements. He gave that job to a young supplicant at his court named Johannes Kepler, who was a mathematician, and he was very eager to work on, on Ptolemy's, uh, or on Tycho's data. And he swore to Tycho he could solve the problem of Mars's orbit and explain it in eight days. It took him more than eight years to figure it out. <laughs> and of course, this is all doing calculations by hand. But what he found was profoundly important. In fact, it's so important, I noticed that as I engineered this talk, his laws keep coming up again and again. So what he discovered is that to explain the motion of Mars, the Sun has to be th at the center of the solar system. And Mars has to go around the Sun, not in a circle, but in an ellipse, a kind of a squash circle, with the Sun at one focus. Not only that, when a planet gets closer to the Sun, it'll speed up. When it gets further away, it'll slow down. And also, the further away a planet is from the Sun, the slower it moves, on average. And he, he, he explained this in a in a mathematical way. So those are Kepler's three laws. Now Kepler's laws did not explain why Mars went around the Sun. He, he didn't explain why his laws worked. They were empirical. They were kinetic laws. Um, that wasn't explained until several decades later when Isaac Newton came up with his laws of motion and gravitation. And also, it was not direct proof the Earth went around the Sun, but it was strong evidence because it was the only thing that could, that could explain the motion of Mars. Now Tycho didn't calculate the rest of the planets. He took Mars as an outlier and assumed the rest of them went around the Sun 
uh, as an ellipse, which indeed they did. So let's, um, where am I here? So a couple of more things, and this is uh, not really mathematical, but it was, an Im it was important in the sense that it finally drove a nail in the coffin of, of Aristotle's laws. And that's when Galileo looked through a telescope. So according to Aristotle, the, the heavens is made of um, a material not found on earth, ether. The celestial orbs are perfect and unchanging, unblemished. And they're affixed to crystal spheres that rotate in complicated ways. But when Galileo looked at the moon, he found the moon was not made of some perfect celestial fluid. It was a lot like the earth. It was blemished. It had mountains and, and craters, uh, valleys, uh, and plains. He saw it was a world much like the earth. He even attempted to measure the height of the mountains by measuring the sun's angle. And he also turned his telescope towards Jupiter and found also that Jupiter was not a piece of celestial fluid. It was a world in its own right with four small worlds rotating around it, which again suggested there were four worlds in the solar system that did not go around the Earth. So just by looking, just by looking and seeing that wha what we see out there is not so different, at least in the moon's case, than what we see down here, that was a huge influence on thinking through the 1600s. All right, let's get out of the solar system. So as I mentioned before, if the Earth goes around the Sun, we should see some effect of the stars moving back and forth. And no one could find this effect. Instruments got better and better and better, but there was no, no, no uh, example of it. Even 2200 years after the death of Aristotle, it took 270 years after the death of Copernicus until someone actually measured that. But before that happened, in 1725, uh, an extremely clever British astronomer who, who may not be well known James Bradley, he would have won a Nobel Prize for this hands down if, if one existed back then. But he was looking for uh, parallax of the stars and he noticed that the star Eltonine in, um, in the constellation Draco, in the head of Draco, the brightest star in Draco, which you can see tonight along with many of the other objects I'm, I'm talking about here. Eltonine was uh, directly overhead from London every day of the year. So he affixed a telescope to the top of a chimney or inside a chimney very narrow chimney with a telescope with a narrow field of view and look for Eltonine every night and look, for an ex and look for a shift in the star back and forth from month to month. He did find a shift. Sorry, I should say the reason you picked a star directly overhead is that it removes the, eff the effect of atmospheric <coughs> refraction. So if, uh, if a star is, is, is not directly overhead, it will actually, it's the path of its light will be bent by the atmosphere, which is a large effect compared to Com compared to aberration. Anyway, Bradley watched uh, uh, Gamma Dr Draconis and just for a couple weeks and he saw it started to move. He, he could trace out a motion. He followed it over the course of the year and he found that Gamma Draconis traced out a tiny ellipse in the sky about uh, 20 arc seconds on its long end and he found the other stars had the same sort of motion. He was perplexed by this. He could not figure out what caused it. The most interesting thing about it is that the star moved in the opposite direction you would expect a parallax, right? So if I'm moving here, I expect my finger to move one way or the other. This star was moving in the opposite direction. He was out sailing one day, looking at weather vanes on a, on a ship in the wind. As, as, the, as the ship moved, the weather vane would move not necessarily into the wind, but according to its own motion. And he figured out what caused it. And it's the same effect that causes vertically falling raindrops to appear to drive into you as you're as you're running through the rain. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of a simple relativistic effect. The light's ex essentially traveling down the telescope. It, it comes in one end and hits the other end of the mirror, and it looks like the star has been deflected. So this is called the aberration of starlight. And it is direct proof that the Earth moves, and it moves around the sun periodically because of that periodic motion of the stars. So it, it was a, an, amazing, an amazing discovery, not just the discovery of the motion, but reasoning through what caused it. All right, so we'll go back to, to the solar system briefly. There's one unit we need to understand, and that's the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So in the early 1700s, we had some idea how far away the Earth was from the Sun, assuming the Earth goes around the Sun, and that was from uh, the parallax of Mars from two different directions on Earth. But Edmund Halley predicted 
A much better way to find the distance was by observing the transit of Venus as it passed across the face of the Sun from two different positions on Earth. And uh, two expeditions, or many expeditions, were sent forth in uh, 1761, 1769 to measure the transit of Venus because it was the best way to measure directly the distance, well, actually of the Earth to Venus, but using one of Kepler's laws, we could calculate the distance from the Earth to the Sun and not just in arbitrary units, in, in miles, if you want. So that was done, and they did work out that the Earth is about 150 million kilometers from, uh, from the Sun, using the transit of Venus at 93 million miles. And I speak both. In Canada, we do lots of metric. Anyway, okay, so back out to the sky. So there's, this, is, this is the principle of using Venus to... Uh, um, so if you observe it from Tahiti and and um, England, you, you'll see a, a quite different position of the transit. All of you probably know this. You saw the transit a few years ago. All right. So finally, in 1838, the math whiz Friedrich Bessel, if you've ever studied physics here or engineering, you probably learned the Bessel functions. Bessel um, developed those functions. But he was also a crack astronomer. And he finally measured the parallax to some of the nearest stars, presumably the nearest stars, because they had the greatest parallax. The biggest parallax he measured was of the star 61 Cygni, which you can see tonight, uh, just uh, east of Deneb. It's about a, a fifth magnitude star. Uh, fairly easy to see. He measured the parallax to be 0.3 arc seconds, which as most of you know is a very tiny angle. So again, this is proof A, more proof that the Earth goes around the Sun. But B, that angle, doing a little bit of trigonometry, Bessel worked out that 61 Cygni is 710,000 times the Earth-Sun distance. They, they could almost not believe this distance. This is now what we would call 11 light years. Much bigger than anyone thought the, 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 the universe would be. That will be a recurring theme here. And this was one of the nearest stars. So over the coming decades, uh, astronomers kept trying to measure distances to stars, and they could only do a few, the closest stars. So, for example, uh, Barnard's star, which you can see tonight in the uh, constellation Ophiuchus, has a measurable um, parallax. So does Sirius, a bright star, Procyon, uh, both of which rise uh, much later tonight. They also, he, um, Bessel and others also found that these stars were not only exhibiting parallax, but they were on the move. So, um, 61 Cygni, for example, moves at four arc seconds a year, which you can notice in your telescope if you measure it carefully. Barnard's star moves at about 0.8 arc seconds per year. Even bright uh, Arcturus moves about two arc seconds per year. And these speeds work out to, you know, about 100, 150 kilometers per second. So these stars, although we can't perceive them, are on the move. The galaxy is like a, it's like a big, a big dust storm with par particles of dust blowing all over the place. We just can't notice it on our time scale. Okay, so now we're getting somewhere. The sun's at the center of the solar system. The stars are absurdly far away and swirling through space at high speed. The universe is starting to seem big and interesting. Now, astronomers kept going and they noticed some stars, some binary stars, like the star 70 of Phaiakai here, which you can see tonight in the it's in a little asterism called Taurus Poniatowski uh, in the, uh, the eastern part of uh, Ophiuchus again. Uh, beautiful double star. I think it's separated by uh, three or four arc seconds right now. The reason I don't know is that what I'm about to tell you. This uh, star is quite close, and these two components move around each other quite quickly in astronomical terms. It's one of the few double stars you can see make a full revolution in a human lifetime. So that makes a full revolution in about 80... Uh, 83 years, and the separation of the star increases from about 1.7 arc seconds to about 6.7 arc seconds. And astronomers could measure the distance to the star because it exhibited parallax. It's not too far away. So knowing all those things, astronomers were able to figure out the mass of the stars uh, and, uh, and their, their true brightness just by measuring these little points of light in the sky and they could compare it to the mass of the sun. Both these stars are just a little bit less massive of the sun. But as you can see, the astronomers are building up tools here to, to teach us more things about what's going on. Now, another important kind of binary star is an eclipsing binary. 
uh, the most famous of which is Algol or Beta Persei, which again you can see tonight. Um, Beta Persei and Sheliak is another one, I think, in, in Lyra. These are two stars that pass in front of each other, sometimes quite quickly. They're very close together. You can't separate them physically in a telescope. But they move very quickly. And if you know the distance to these stars, again, you can get their mass. You can also get their radius. And you can get their temperature. So we're starting to see what the stars are like physically. They're big. They're hot. Uh, they move quickly. And they're massive. Now, <coughs> another important type of variable star, a great tool uh, used by astronomers, are the Cepheid variables. So they're named after Delta Cephei uh, in the constellation Cepheus, which you can see tonight. Uh, Eta Aquilae is also uh, a, a, vari uh, a Cepheid variable, and so is Polaris, although it doesn't have a very big uh, amplitude. Anyway, Delta Cephei varies um, from about magnitude five, uh, 3.5 to 4.4 uh, every 5.4 days, um, just like clockwork. Kay? It's been doing it for hundreds of years, maybe thousands or millions, we don't know. Now, in the early 20th century, the astronomer, astronomer Henrietta Leavitt made an astonishing discovery. By looking at Cepheid variables in the large Ma Magellanic Cloud, she noticed, and assuming that they're all in the cloud, they're all about the same distance away. She noticed that the um, apparent brightness is proportional to the period uh, of, of variability. So the longer it takes a variable star, a Cepheid variable, to change it, its brightness from peak to peak, the brighter it is. So if you could just calibrate this, if you could find out the true brightness of a Cepheid variable, you could use them to find the distance to things that are very far away star clusters, and maybe even things that are farther. And sure enough, in time, we were able to find some Cepheid variables and figure out the uh, distance to them either with parallax or with some statistical arguments. And so they were reasonably well calibrated. So there are we, know, we know now there are two types of Cepheid variables, type 1 and type 2. Delta Cephei is a type 1. It's a brighter variable. There's also another kind of uh, standard candle like this, called an RR Lyrae variable. These are much, uh, they're intrinsically fainter stars. Um, and they don't have as large an, uh, as large an amplitude uh, in brightness, and they also vary much more quickly. So RR Lyrae, which you can see tonight, varies from seventh to eighth magnitude in about 13 and a half hours. You can even track it tonight if you like. Okay, so let's do a quick recap here. So from 1500, when Aristotle ruled, to 1800, we went from an Earth-centered universe where the stars are fixed and unchanging and the planets are made of some unknowable celestial fluid to a universe of physical laws where we know the size of the solar system, the distance and size and temperature of the stars, and we even found out, using the science of spectroscopy, what the stars are made of, which one philosopher in the early 1800s held as an example of knowledge we could never have. We could never figure out what the stars are made of. Sure enough, 30 years ago, we did. And we found out that the stars are made of the same stuff we find down here, more or less. Hydrogen, iron, uh, calcium, um, uh, silicon, that sort of thing. But the best stuff was yet to come. So let's go a little, a little bigger here, the Milky Way. So when you're out tonight, step back and have a look at the Milky Way, which it looks like we're going to see tonight. Now the first thing you notice is that uh, as you look at the Milky Way, and just a the distribution of stars in general in the night sky, that they're not, the stars are not uniformly distributed, like you might see on a, uh, an outtake from Star Trek The Next Generation. Oh, I hated the uniform stars in that show. So, for example, if you look uh, over to the east tonight as Pegasus uh, rises and Pisces and Piscis Astrinus, you'll see there's, there's fewer bright stars over in that direction. Whereas if you look to the southwest, where Scorpius and Sagittarius are, up through Aquila and Cygnus and over to the north towards Cassiopeia and then to the east towards Perseus, there's tons of bright stars and there's the Milky Way. Now, of course, before telescopes, no one knew what the Milky Way was. But you aim a pair of binoculars at it and you can see that it's made of stars. Herschel knew this, William Herschel knew this in the late 1700s, and he endeavored to map the Milky Way using a few assumptions. So one assumption, he assumed that all stars were the same brightness, okay? A little bit shaky. 
But by assuming that, he could figure out that a dim star is further away than a bright star, okay? You've got to start somewhere. Um, he also assumed that there was no impeding of starlight. He didn't know about interstellar dust. So he assumed that the light came all the way here. And by doing that, he counted stars in different blocks of the sky and came up with this first map of the Milky Way like this. And he concluded that the sun, the solar system, was at or very near the center of a flat disk of stars, and we are inside that disk somewhere. So it's sort of flat here, and we're sort of near the center. And this was the view uh, of the galaxy from the late 1700s right through to the early 20th century. This work was redone by an astronomer named Captain, and he found this Captain, and he found the same sort of uh, map of the galaxy. All right, until 1915, when an astronomer named Harlow Shapley used uh, the biggest telescope in the world to find out once and for all where we are in the Milky Way and our position, and what then was taken to be the whole universe. Now, Shapley was an interesting character. He was a he dropped out of fifth grade in rural Missouri. Uh, before going back into high school and going to university. He said um, he picked astronomy. He, he, he picked a subject by looking at the college catalog and he picked the first thing he could pronounce. He couldn't pronounce archaeology, so he picked astronomy. And that's how he went into astronomy, he said. But he became one of the greats. In fact, his son, Lloyd Shapley, just passed away earlier this year. He was a mathematician and an economist who won the Nobel Prize in, in 2012. Anyway, Shapley noticed as most of us have, if we picked up a star map and perused it, that globular clusters are not scattered evenly throughout the sky. Most globular clusters are over to one side of the sky, towards the constellations Scorpius and Sagittarius, for example. There's definitely outliers. I mean, there's, there, there are some, some uh, globular clusters quite far away from there, but I mean, I mean name one globular cluster in, in Ursa, Ursa Major, for example. Probably someone in this crowd could, but I can't. Anyway, his solution was, his, sorry, his assumption was that globular clusters having mass are attracted to the part of galaxy, the part of the galaxy that has the most mass, that is the most stars. So he saw more stars over to one side of the sky. He assumed the globulars were, were bundled around there in a, in, a, in a spherical halo with some outliers. So again, we can see that tonight. Just look at your star map and look at where the globular clusters are. But he went one step further, and this is why he was a genius. He used RR Lyrae stars to measure the distance to these globular clusters to uh, about 30 of the 150 known globular clusters in the Milky Way. So for example, he measured uh, the distance to 47 Tucanae and Omega Centauri, southern globular clusters. He found they were about 10,000 light years away, a big, dif a big distance compared to the nearby stars. He measured uh, intermediate uh, globular clusters, two that you could see tonight, uh, Messier 13 in Hercules and Messier 3 in, uh, in uh, uh, Keynes Venetici. And he also, and they're about 25, 30,000 light years away, a big distance. And he uh, measured um, the distance to uh, one of my favorite globular clusters, M22, just off the teapot of, of Sagittarius. And again, it's about 10 or 12,000 light years away. So his result was this. He actually measured the position and the distance to these globular clusters. And he worked out that the sun is at the edge of this distribution of clusters. And given that the assumption, which turns out to be correct, that these clusters are, are around the center of the Milky Way, it turns out that we're out on the edge of the Milky Way. The sun is not near the center of the Milky Way, just like the Earth is not at the center of the solar system. Not only that, but he measured or estimated the distance. We're about 25,000 light years from the center of the Milky Way. And the Milky Way itself, he estimated to be about 100,000 light years across. An enormous distance in that day. And again, this is only 101 years ago. So what happened next, and Shapley was a big part of this, was the so-called great debate in astronomy in the late teens and early uh, 1920s. And the, the great debate focused on spiral nebulae, as they were called. So in a big telescope, astronomers looked at things like M51 uh, at the top here and M101 at the bottom, uh, Andromeda, for example, and they could see spiral arms. They could see the shape. But some astronomers thought that they were uh, new star systems forming within the Milky Way galaxy. 
that they were relatively close by, and that the Milky Way galaxy was the whole universe. Everything we see out there is part of one galaxy, and that is the universe. Other astronomers were not so sure. Um, they knew that the, the spectrum of these galaxies was made of stars, or sorry, of these nebula was, was made of stars. Um, they also, there was a, there was a measurement in, in the late teens again of a possible rotation of one of these clusters, of one of these nebulae. It looked like um, you could actually see it rotating over a couple of years, which again implies it must be very close by, because if it was far away, we wouldn't be able to detect that rotation. Anyway, so people went back and forth about this for a long time. Uh, there was even a great debate at the Smithsonian in Washington in 1920 between Harlow Shapley and Heber Curtis of Lick, Lick Observatory. Curtis took the view that, that these nebulae were actually galaxies outside the Milky Way. And this was on the front page of all the newspapers. I mean, scientists were like movie stars back then. But in science, you can debate all you want. Eventually, someone has to stop talking and make a measurement. And that, that person uh, was, was Edwin Hubble. So Hubble had at his, disposable, at his disposal the world's biggest telescope and a fair size ego. And, and he, had, he had a fair bit of ambition too. And he was looking at the largest spiral nebula, the Andromeda Nebula, which you can see tonight. And he could actually resolve individual stars on his photographic plates with his telescope. And he came across what he thought was a, was a nova, a star that was giving, a, you know, not a supernova, but a star that was suddenly brightening and then uh, reducing in brightness. And then he realized it was coming back again and it was a variable star. It was a Cepheid variable star that were calibrated in size. And so he could use these Cepheid variables to estimate the distance to the Andromeda Nebula, which he estimated to be about one million light years, a preposterous distance in those days which has later been revised to two million plus light years. So the great debate was over. These, if the Milky Way galaxy is only 100,000 light years across and the biggest nebula, spiral nebula, is two million light years away, these are external galaxies. They call them island universes. And again, the universe exploded in size. So less than 100 years before this, people couldn't believe a distance of 11 light years. Now we're up to a million light years or two million. So Hubble measured uh, many more of these nebula, of course, uh, Cepheids Cif and M33, which you can see tonight. Also uh, M81 uh, in, in Ursa Major, Bode's Galaxy, uh, and, and many others as his instrumentation got better and better. But Hubble was just getting started with his telescope. As he began to measure the distance to more and more of these spiral nebula, he also learned to measure the speed of them. And there was another astronomer uh, named Vesto Slipher, one of the great uh, astronomical names of all time, working at Lowell Observatory with a much smaller telescope, so he couldn't see Cepheids, but he could measure the speed of receding galaxies. And he had the best study of the speed of galaxies, they were now called galaxies, um, both near and far. So he noticed some galaxies were coming towards us, some were moving away. The fainter they were, it seemed the faster they were moving away, which he noted in a paper for which he got a standing ovation at, a, at an astronomy conference in, in, uh, in, in the early 20s. And, you know, standing ovations at astronomy conferences are not, not common things. Now, um, Hubble, Hubble used Slipher's measurements, and to be frank, he used them without even acknowledging them in his paper, which is a scientific faux pas. But he combined, Hubble combined his distances with Slipher's um, speeds of these galaxies. And even with their crude measurements of the day, he noticed that the further away a galaxy was, on average, the faster away it seemed to be moving. They seemed to, be the fir they seemed to move away from us and faster and faster the further out they get. Now, nearby galaxies, they can move towards us away, but the further out you go, um, there seems to be some clear, uh, uh, what's now called Hubble flow of galaxies moving faster and faster. And these speeds are thousands of uh, kilometers uh, per second, these galaxies moving away from us. So he measured, uh, as a part of this study, uh, he measured galaxies mostly in the Virgo cluster, which is set tonight, but galaxies that we know well, like Messier 104 was on Hubble's measure list, NGC 4565, my, my own personal favorite galaxy, the edge on spiral, NGC uh, 3115 and Sextons. But also he, he did look at galaxies we can see tonight if you're hankering to look what, what Hubble looked like, looked at. 
So the spindle galaxy NGC 5866 is about 50 million light years away and it moves away at about 670 kilometers per second. M82 is a little closer, about 12 mil million light years, it moves about 200 kilometers per second. NGC 1023 in Perseus, again about 60 million light years and 600 kilometers per second. And you can see these galaxies tonight. So, of course, we know now, and, and even at that time, that European theorists were explaining why this is happening. The reason the galaxies are moving away from us faster and faster is that space itself is expanding. Something that Einstein proved uh, independently of Hubble around the same time with his general theory of relativity. It was such a preposterous idea that Einstein didn't even want to believe it. And here was Hubble and Slipher measuring it. All right, so there's another interesting galaxy we can put on our observing list tonight, and I'm jumping forward in history a little bit, but just this is so cool. It, it was done by a, for a former Canadian. It was uh, done by uh, Wendy Friedman, who went to the University of Toronto and worked out of uh, the Carnegie uh, Institute in, 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 DC in, um, in California, and she's now just moved to the University of Chicago. Anyway, it was a fantastic measurement. It was, it was a way to calibrate the CFIAT variables because our knowledge of them, the, the, the variability period and their distance was known you know, to 20% or something, which means the size of the universe is not known that accurately. So this was an enormous study that all hinged on this one galaxy, Messier 106, which you can see under the handle of the Big Dipper tonight if you look low. And it's a favorite for galaxy imagers. It's a beautiful galaxy. But what uh, um, members of, of this team did was to directly measure the distance to this galaxy, not using variable stars, but by measuring a uh, the distance to this gigantic water mega maser in near the core of M106. So a maser is, um, it's like a laser, but it, it spits out microwaves that are quite um, strongly focused and directional. And um, by, by looking at the position, the change in position of, uh, of this water mega maser, they were able to figure out the, um, the acceleration and apply Kepler's laws to figure out the size of the water mega maser and then the distance to M106 independently. You know, in the same way we measured the distance to Venus uh, 150 years before, 250 years before. And they worked out, um, so uh, by doing that, they could estimate Hubble's constant, which is a measure of the age of the universe. So this was in 2001, and they measured the Hubble constant to be about 62 kilometers per second per megaparsec, plus or minus 10%. This was a big deal back in the day. We now know it's about 67 or 68, and we know it to just a few percent. But this was a big deal, and it was all done with the help of M106. So now let's go a little deeper and look into the structure of things. So again, as you'll notice in your star charts, galaxies, uh, you'll see a few outliers here and there, but they tend to cluster together with the help of gravity. So if you have a look at uh, your star map between the stars Vindemiatrix and De Nebula, for example, in, uh, in the constellations Virgo and Leo, now, they're set tonight, but you'll see a big gaggle of galaxies, and that is the Virgo cluster. It covers a, a patch of sky about the size of your fist held at arm's length. But there's, uh, there's other galaxy clusters, too, that are further away. So the Coma cluster, for example, um, it might cover a patch of sky about as big as your fingernail in the, con in the constellation Coma Berenices. But in the field of view of your telescope, there's dozens of the brightest of thousands of galaxies in this cluster. And this cluster, and you can see the two brightest members here in, in this false color image in green, uh, NGC 4889 and 4874, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, magnitude 12 objects that you could see, you know, with a small daub um, when, when the cluster is out. Now, the Coma cluster, if you have a bigger Dobsonian, 15, 18 inches, you could see easily see a dozen, couple dozen members in the field, a single field of view of an eyepiece. Now, this cluster is important because it gave us the first hint of dark matter in 1930. So the astronomer Fritz Zwicky noticed that the internal motion of the galaxy cluster was very large. These galaxies are whipping around each other very fast. But there's not enough mass to hold them in. They're actually moving so quickly they should fly off into space and there should be no coma cluster. But the fact that they're held by together means there must be some hidden, uh, large amount of hidden mass in the coma cluster, which he called dunkel materie, which we call now dark, dark matter. So that was a, a measurement from the 30s. 
So if you are pining for a galaxy cluster tonight, Pers the Perseus galaxy cluster is visible. It's also about 250 million light years away. It's receding at about 5,400 kilometers per second. And its brightest galaxy is the Seifert galaxy here, NGC 1275. It's about magnitude uh, 12.6. Now, if you want to go deeper, I don't know, I haven't seen the scopes out in the field, but you can go as far as 500 million light years to see the Hercules galaxy cluster, Hercules galaxy cluster, and about a million light years to see the core Bohr cluster in the constellation Corona Borealis. Now, there are also even larger structures than galaxy clusters, even larger than galaxy superclusters, which are clusters of clusters. And these are big bubbles in space where there's really not much of anything. And we can see a hint of one tonight, or rather you don't see anything because there's nothing there. But if you look towards uh, the constellation Bootes, there's a big void where there's almost no, there's no galaxies accessible to small telescopes and even to big telescopes. And this void is about 250 million light years across and it's on the near edge of the Hercules cluster. So this hit hints at the large scale structure of the universe, which is, um, galaxy superclusters strung along filaments, and these filaments are separated by gigantic regions of nothing that are called bubbles. And this Bootes void, which you can't see tonight because it's a void, is, uh, is, is accessible, if you will. All right, but there are more distant objects accessible in backyard telescopes, quasars, that most of you have heard of, and it's about as far as you can see with a backyard telescope. Now, quasars were discovered in the early 1960s with the big telescope at Palomar, big 200-inch telescope, um, by uh, Martin Schmidt and others. And they were a bit of a mystery for a long time. They looked like stars, but they had these huge redshifts, which implied huge uh, recession speeds, which, according to Hubble's law, meant they're very far away. Now, the Hubble telescope solved this. The Hubble telescope could see that these quasars were just the cores of, of galaxies, very active cores where huge energetic processes are taking place. Now the nearest quasar is 3C273 in the constellation Virgo, which is getting, uh, it's, it's, it's not gonna be visible tonight. It's about magnitude 12 and a half or so. Now it's about two and a half billion light years away. And yet you could see it with an eight or 10 inch telescope if you look carefully, which implies it's shining with the light of about four trillion suns. So these are very luminous objects. Now, there's other quasars, too. About the farthest thing I've ever seen in a telescope, um, with the help of a Mellencamp, uh, was the quasar uh, uh, Q1634 plus 706. And it's not in Virgo. It's in the constellation Draco. That's a mistake on my part. It's just below the, the bowl of the Little Dipper. It's magnitude 14.4, and it's about 8.6 billion, well, it, its distance is so far, it actually takes me a little while to explain its distance. So there's three distances for objects that are this far away. One is the light travel time, the time it took the light to travel to us. In the case of this quasar, it's about 8.6 billion years. But in the time that quasar was traveling towards us, or in the light that was traveling towards us, um, the quasar got further away. So the current cosmological models, the rate of expansion of the universe suggests this quasar is now about 12.9, 13 billion light years away, which is about a quarter of the way across the visible universe. And of course, the third distance is when the, quas when the light actually left the quasar. Uh, at that time, the universe was, m was much smaller. Things were closer together. And the quasar, was I, 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 didn't, I couldn't look up a value for it, but it might have been you know, 2 billion light years away, thereabouts. And again, you can see these photons coming into your telescope tonight if you're persistent enough. And these photons are about twice the age of the solar system. Now, there's some other quasars, too. Uh, one is the, this is a most extraordinary object, the double quasar in, in Ursa Major. So the double quasar, uh, okay, so yeah, so this is a, a Hubble image. You see two images of a quasar. They both have very similar spectra. They're moving away very quickly, but it's actually just a single quasar. And this is a, a visual, this is a visible, uh, this is visible evidence of what Einstein predicted in his general theory of relativity. And that's the bending of space by a large mass. So these quasars, again, are about eight billion, have an eight billion light year travel time. 
but in the, in the much closer foreground, a few hundred million light years away, is a very faint galaxy, a massive galaxy, that's bending the light from these quasars into two different paths. And that's why we see two of them. So this is an extraordinary sight if you could see this through a telescope. They're split by about six arc seconds, a generous split, but again, they're very, very distant. So uh, if you have some electronic aid, you might tackle this tonight. And then if that's too easy, there's always Einstein's, there's always Einstein's cross. So also 8 billion-ish light year travel time. It's almost 17th magnitude in the constellation Pegasus. And it's another beautiful example of gravitational lensing that you could see with your own eye if you're very skilled and lucky. So the apparent size is only 1.6 arc seconds. This is a very small object. It's very faint. If you see it tonight, please come and get me. I would love to see it too. <laughs> now, we're getting to the edge of what, astron what amateur equipment can do. But if we had bigger telescopes, as big as the professionals, we'd see more and more quasars the further out we'd, we'd look. We'd see tens of thousands of quasars further and further out. And then we would see not much. The quasars drop off, the galaxies drop off, the stars drop off, because we're looking so far back in time that uh, the first stars and galaxies haven't had a chance to form yet, or at least not in huge numbers back then. And this is an active and very important area of current astronomical research. But the fact that we can look so far back out into the sky and see nothing but darkness is important uh, in itself. The fact that we can see a dark sky implies two important things. One or both important. One or, one or both things that are important. It implies that the observable universe is finite in size. Or it's finite in age. There hasn't been enough time the further out we look for stars to form. Because if it went on forever, eventually, no matter where we looked, our line of sight would fall on a star. Now the light from that star would be very faint, but there'd be more stars in that little little bit of angle we can see out there. So if the universe was infinite, we would see a night sky as bright as the sun or the surface of a star. So the fact that it's dark tells us something very important about the universe, that it's limited in size and or age. Now, of course, if you're a stickler, of course, we do see something with microwave and radio telescopes. We see the cosmic microwave background uh, that is a, a vestige of the Big Bang that's stretched out to microwave wavelengths but we don't see any individual stars. <coughs> so I've run out of universe to survey. <laughs> but you can see the idea here that the objects we've toured tonight, and this is just a, a, a subset uh, of objects, we've toured the intellectual battlef battlefields of this great battle, if you will, to understand our universe, starting with what the Earth is, to is the Earth the center of, of the solar system or the sun? Is the sun the center of the universe? Is the Milky Way the universe? And of course, the more things we found out, the more astonishing, we, we've, the more astonishing things we've discovered. And again, you could see dozens of these objects uh, with your own telescope tonight if you want. So that's about all I have to say about this. I do have, I actually printed out a list of the objects I, meant I mentioned in this talk. I've got about 20 sheets here, but if you, didn't get it, you can down, download it. You can download it at, at my, my educational websites, but this same, it's a single sheet you can download. Just click and it'll download. Cosmicpursuits.com uh, forward slash BYC, Backyard Cosmologist 2016. Or you can come and, come and grab a, a copy of the list here and start hunting for these things uh, tonight. Anyway, so that's it. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Oh, ma'am. Sorry. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to point out that it was not Hubble who figured out where the star yardstick. It was Henrietta Swamata. I did mention that. It's her handwriting. Yeah. I, oh, oh, sorry. In that plate. In that plate. Her handwriting is what says I stand corrected. I thought Hubble made that note. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a copy of museum. Which museum? Fantastic. My favorite museum. Is it, so not to get into it with you here, is it visible to the general public of which I am a member? Yeah? Okay, I've got to, I've got to find that. Other questions? <coughs> <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, the first, the first clear night, I understand. I'm going to grab my camera too. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. List. There you go.